Hello, V. Anton Sprawl here again with another video about how you can learn to think like a programmer. In the next few videos, I'm going to talk about real world problems. In the other videos so far, I've created artificial problems that illustrate the point I needed to make. Now, ultimately, a good programmer needs to be able to work with all sorts of problem types. But I know that many programmers have extra trouble solving problems that are abstract or too artificial. If you suspect that you are one of these programmers, trying real-world problems may be a good idea. Also, of course, there's a certain satisfaction in solving a real-world problem. As a programmer, if I solve any problem, I feel good, but I can't always share that feeling with non-programmers. With a real-world problem, you can bask in the afterglow of accomplishment with your non-programmer friends and family. The thing is, though, that you've got to find a real-world problem, and that's not always easy, especially if your problem-solving abilities are still at an early stage. You don't want to start a problem that you can't make progress on. So a key tool here is one we've talked about in several of these videos, namely, reducing the problem scope. Here, what I would recommend is dividing the problem into as many separate goals as you can. Think of it like a Kickstarter project for a game, where how much they plan to put in the game depends on how much money is donated. In this case, the goals are tied to how quickly you make progress. So in the next few videos, I'm going to work on a real-world problem and show you the steps I'm taking along the way. This is the real deal, without me editing the results to make myself look like a genius. Some of you have noticed that the code I show in previous videos isn't always optimal, and that will be the case here. This series is about problem solving. Now, after you have a solution in hand, it's always a good idea to look for improvements or even a better approach altogether to a problem, which is something I talk more about in the book. At this stage, though, we just want something that works. So here's the problem I'm going to work on, and it relates directly to my books. You see, I draw the rough versions of the figures for my books. These are referenced in the books with numbers, like figure 5-1 and so on. The problem is that during the editing process, figures sometimes get dropped or added or rearranged. When this happens, the figures have to be renumbered. If I remove what was the first illustration in a chapter, for example, I then have to renumber all the other figures in that chapter. As you might expect, this can be a tedious process. It can be tricky sometimes because I'll reference a figure that occurred much earlier in the chapter. And sometimes the same chapter gets rearranged multiple times. So I want to create something that's going to automatically renumber my figures. Now, I've been writing my books using an ancient version of Microsoft Word, so this code is going to be a Microsoft Word macro. That means that unlike the previous examples in these videos, this code's not going to be in C++, but rather in VBA, or Visual Basic for Applications. Honestly, I haven't written much code in VBA, but the thing is, if you know how to solve problems, the language you're working in should never stop you, although it may slow you down a bit. Macro programming can be a great source of good real-world problems because it often relates to the software you use all the time and usually macros don't involve a huge amount of code. In this first video, I'm just going to properly describe what I hope to do. Here's a sample from the manuscript for Think Like a Programmer. You can see the caption for this illustration begins with the word figure and a figure number. The number before the hyphen is the chapter number, and then within a chapter, all the figures are numbered consecutively. And here is a reference to that figure. So I need the macro to do two things. First, it needs to determine what number should be used for each figure, meaning the number after the hyphen. And then all references within the text of each figure need to be correct, reflecting any changes. So that's my goal but I'm not gonna get there all in one step. In the next video, I'll get started with the code. Stay tuned. 